and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here in this virtual place and um, especially um, of course to Eva and Inya for making this event possible in these very strange times. Okay, fingerings on string instruments play a double role. On the one hand, they are necessary evil to allow for the execution of the notes and chords of a string part. On the other hand, and this is especially true for 19th century performance practice, they have an important part in the interpretation of the music. They play a role in organizing the phrasing and they are at the core of one of the most important expressive means, the portamento, or the carrying of the voice in imitation of the singing voice. It is only through the fingerings that the portamento can be executed on the string instruments as this needs the shifting of the hand and with it the fingers, um, the shifting of the fingers from one position on the fingerboard to another while gliding on the string for a more or less continuous change of pitch between the notes. The reconstruction of exact fingerings is particularly important also for the reenactment of recordings. In this presentation, I will show some ways of analyzing fingerings and portamenti, some of which may seem obvious, others may be less so. I apologize that some of this will be quite technical and some of it will be string or even violin specific. When I was working on my PhD on Josef Joachim, some of the most valuable sources to work with were his editions. However, most of the later editions were not done by Joachim alone, but in collaboration with his assistant, Andreas Moser. One edition in particular, the Bach Solo Sonatas and Partitas, poses a lot of questions because it was released almost a year after Joachim had died, and it is unclear how much of it could be attributed to Joachim and how much was made up by Moser after Joachim had passed away. In 1919, Joachim's former student, Tivadan Nashe, criticized this edition as distorting Josef Joachim's intentions. In particular, he took offense in a specific fingering. If any of his pupils had ever attempted to play the end of the bourré in the B minor partita of Bach arpeggiated a la Moser, Joachim would have broken his bow over their heads. This is what Nashe wrote. I will return to this example later to find out whether Nashe's critique is justified and I will try to deconstruct exactly which fingering Joachim used himself in his 1903 recording. But before I do, I want to show you a few ways of examining string fingerings and portamenti in recordings and explain why this can be important for performance research. Let me begin with an example of one particular portamento and different ways to execute it. I chose this example as it demonstrates particularly well how different, uh, how different performing traditions can be distinguished by portamento practice and how these portamenti can be differentiated in sonic visualizer spectrograms. This is the Abendlied by Robert Schumann in Joachim's arrangement, which had an almost iconic meaning for the Joachim tradition. While there isn't a recording with Joachim himself. There is one with Marie Soldat, who is seen as one of Joachim's most faithful students, a fact, a fact which is on the whole supported by her recordings. Two of her recordings, however, are quite problematic, as Joachim, by all accounts, would, in the words of Nashe, probably have bro broken his bow over her head. One is the arrangement of the Bach air on the G string by Wilhelmi, which Joachim vehemently rejected, and the other happens to be the Abendlied, not because of the work itself, for which Joachim was actually famous, but because of the piece in D major instead of D flat major, which is much easier, but which Joachim very much disapproved of. Examining her fingerings in Portamenti helps to find out whether her performance does otherwise conform with Joachim's practice. In fact, it turns out that even though she plays the piece in D major, her fingerings are almost exactly those which we know Joachim used. And using Sonic Visualizer, we can see exactly the type of Portamento she uses. So listen to this excerpt. Thank you. 
In this rather obvious example, Marie Soldat slides up from the F sharp in her case to the A, then there is a leap up to the D. This is a school book portamento of the German school, exactly as Louis Spohr, Ferdinand David and Josef Jarin teach them to be executed. Using flesh systematic, this would be a so-called B portamento, short for a portamento with the beginning finger. Technically, this is done by sliding on the first finger from the F sharp to the A and then stopping the D with the fourth finger. It is possible to do this from first to third position on the E string or from fifth to seventh position on the A string, which is what Joachim would have done. With Sonic Visualizer, we can identify the exact pitches where the slide begins and ends, which helps to find out what is happening. This particular instance doesn't really require sonic visualizer though. Most violinists would probably be able to hear this from listening to the recording a few times. However, often things are much less obvious. Listen to how Eugène Isaïe plays this portamento. describes this special Isaïe portamento as a fantasy portamento, a fantasy portamento. At first sight, the spectrogram looks quite similar to the one of Soldat's recording, but there seems to be no step. It sounds very different from what Soldat does, almost as though Isaïe is sliding all the way on the same finger, but that is in fact not the case. But it is hard to hear what exactly Isaïe does here. Let's listen again just to this portamento, but this time as slow as Sonic Visualizer allows and with the spectrogram spaced out a little bit more. There is in fact a step in the slide, but it's much smaller and somewhere in the middle, and it is hard to tell where exactly it is. This kind of portamento can only really be done with adjacent fingers, otherwise the step would be larger. It is fair to assume that Isai starts sliding with the first finger, then puts his second finger right next to it and continues the slide, ending on the second finger on the D. That means that Isai arrives on the D with the second finger and it is useful to look at what follows after. So listen again. There's another portamento from the D flat to the B flat, which is clearly on the same finger, and also one from the A flat to the G, which is quite obviously done with two fingers, where the fing first finger slides below the G, and then the G is stopped with the second finger. This is called an anticipazione della nota. Altogether, the exact fingering Isai uses for this phrase becomes obvious after analyzing the types of portamenti. Let me turn to another example. What you see here is the first violin part of the edition of Beethoven's String Quartet Opus 127 by Josef Joachim. The particular difficulty here is the lower A flat, which makes it impossible to play the whole passage in first position. The A flat cannot be played on the A string and a double string crossing to the following G would be extremely awkward. It is a tricky passage and it needs a position change somewhere in these three bars. There is a recording of this work by the Klingler Quartet, which for various reasons might be the best evidence of how the Joachim Quartet might have performed the work. It would be easy to assume that Karl Klingler used the fingering from his teacher's edition, and for much of it he does, but here he clearly does not. Before we listen to the passage, let me explain what one would expect to hear if Klingler did play exactly the fingerings which Joachim indicated. In these three bars, there are two actual position changes in Joachim's edition, of which one would certainly be audible, the one from the B flat to the A flat. To follow the fingering, the violinist would have to move the hand from the first position on the B flat to the fourth position or an extended third position on the A flat, because this happens under a slur, and because the leap is quite a large one, the shift would certainly be audible. According to the German tradition, 
the first finger would slide from the B flat to either the E flat or at least to the D or the D flat. Let's hear it played by the Klingler Quartet. This is clearly not what Klingler does. And it's, it's quite confusing to listen to this in um, normal speed. So let's hear it once more slowly. like that, I know, but it's necessary sometimes. For clarity, I've marked the notes. Some of them are quite difficult to see because the second violin is playing in the same range, sometimes the same notes. There is actually a slide near the A flat, but it happens after the note has been reached and it originates from the second violin. What is clearly visible, however, is a slide going up to the E, although there is no lower note preceding it. The explanation is quite simple. Klingler shifts into third position on the E, and this cannot be done inaudibly under a slur. There are two ways to do this. One either slides from the G up or to the E, which is in fact what Klingler does, out of necessity, not for expression. So by carefully analyzing the sliding, one can often deconstruct exactly, or at least nearly exactly, the used fingering. But there are a few more tricks to deconstruct fingerings in, the, in special situations. And with this, I will come back to the dubious fingering which Pivadar Nashe criticized as being Moses and not Joachim's and the questions as to what exactly Joachim did at this passage in his own recording from 1903. In this particular case, portamenti os look for, yet it is actually possible to reconstruct exactly what Joachim did. Let us first Listen to Joachim's recording. <laughs> Just by listening, we can say that A, Joachim does not play an arpeggiated chord a la Mosa here on just two strings for this chord. And B, Joachim plays an extra note, a C sharp here, to make, making this a triple stop too. But does he play the fingering which Nashe suggests in his edition, and which is probably what most, uh, probably the most common fingering for this passage? Because the Nashe edition is hard to read, I've added another edition by a Joachim student here, which has exactly the same fingering as Nashe. Nashe plays both these chords in a stretched second position, and this is prepared for by staying in second position for the notes preceding it. To understand which fingering Joachim uses, it is again useful to look to know what he does just before. The first chord in this measure cannot be played any other way than with the indicated fingering, and it is found in both the Nashe and the Joachim Moser editions. Looking at the spectrogram of this passage in Joachim's recording, the first thing we discover is that Joachim does not stay in second position here but seems to play exactly as it is indicated in the Joachim Moser edition. If Joachim did stay in the second position as Nashe does, the out of tune and unstable G would be difficult to explain. There seems to be a position change here, otherwise the G would be exactly the same as before. But what exactly does he do for the following two chords? Let's play just the two chords slowly. Perhaps we can hear a little bit more. Again, what we can hear is that Yari manages to play the notes of the chords almost simultaneously and not arpeggiated. That means he certainly plays them on three strings and does not arpeggiate as is indicated in his edition. We also hear that certain notes are not perfectly in tune. In this particular case, the spectrogram has more visual clues. In the first chord, Joachim uses the open E string for the middle note, 
just as indicated in the edition. The reason we can be absolutely certain about this is the fact that the E sounds visibly later than the other two notes. This can only happen if the G is played on the A string, so it is struck together with the A sharp, and then the pressure of the bow increases enough to also strike the open E string a fraction of a second later. It is technically impossible for the A string to be struck later than the D and the E string together, so it has to be an open E string. This seems to conform with Mozart's fingering of this chord, but there is a little detail which doesn't seem to fit. The A sharp seems to start and finish a little higher than it is supposed to be, which is unlikely, though not impossible, if this fingering was used. So why is that? If the A sharp is played with the second finger and the G with the fourth, this means that the fingers need to be very close together as it is only really the distance of a whole tone on the fingerboard. So one would expect, if anything, the A sharp to have a tendency to be lower and the G to be higher than in tune, but not the other way around. It seems more likely that Joachim a slightly different fingering for this chord, where the stretch of the hand results in a tendency of the A-sharp to rise, which is the case if the A-sharp is played with the third finger, as, in, as I've um, illustrated with my own hand here. Let's examine the next chord. We already know that Joachim does not arpeggiate on two strings. What we can see in the spectrogram is that the bottom note, the B, is relatively stable, while the middle note starts too low. The top note, on the other hand, starts high and is relatively unstable. It remains sharp most of the time. Only at the end, Joachim manages to correct it a little. All of this points to this fingering, where the B is played with the fourth finger and the D with the second finger, both in second position, and the F sharp played with the first finger stretched into first position. That explains why it, is, it tends to be a little bit high. This way, it is possible to deduct the complete fingering for these chords. It does, in fact, appear in another edition by a Joachim student, Jeno Hubai, who, one who very much based his edition on Joachim's teaching. The only thing that he doesn't add, of course, is the, the C sharp in the third chord. But why did Moser include such an odd fingering in the edition when supposedly Joachim didn't play it? I think there may be a good answer to that also. While it is perfectly possible that by 1907, at the age of almost 76 and in weakened health, Joachim simply could not no longer play the difficult fingering, which he still played in 1903 when he made his recording, perhaps a more likely scenario is this. When Joachim and Moser worked on the edition, Joachim used to play the movements repeatedly while Moser took notes in the score. We know this from um, Moser's um, biography. And Joachim was then to check and correct what Moser had written down. However, before they could finish the work, Joachim became seriously ill and passed away. So Moser had to find some solutions for those movements or passages which Joachim hadn't been able to check or which he hadn't finished annotating. One could say he had to make up the missing annotations, but perhaps that wasn't so much the case. Personally, I believe that Moser simply borrowed from the edition which he used to take his notes in. And that edition was almost certainly Ferdinand David's, where we find quite a similar solution to the difficult passage. David actually plays both of these chords arpeggiated on two strings. Perhaps Moser noted that Joachim used the open E string on the first chord, although he got the exact fingering for that chord slightly wrong. But perhaps he had no marking for the second chord and having to come up with a solution, he simply borrowed David's relatively easy to play fingering. Whether Joachim would have allowed this solution is yet another question. He might well have objected to Moser's fingering had he had a chance to check it. However, in my opinion, this particular passage does not necessarily devalue Moser's edition altogether. While, it's, it, while it is certainly worth knowing that not all the markings in this edition are authorized by Joachim, Moser seems to have tried to be as faithful to Joachim's performance as he could. The use of David's edition to fill in the gaps is certainly not far-fetched. We know that 
Joachim Liu started edition himself and he got advice on the performance of these works from David during his time in Leipzig. Finally, here's the rest of Nashi's quote. As an interpreter of Beethoven and Bach in particular, there has never been anyone to equal Joachim, yet he never played the same Bach composition twice in the same way. In our class and Hubei and I used to bring our copies of the sonatas with us to make marginal notes while Joachim played to us. And these instantaneous musical snapshots remain very interesting. So to conclude, it's quite obvious that Joachim probably used different fingerings each time he played it. He was not fixed to one fingering and the one Musa gives is probably not one which he used. But it's still um, the only instance of such an arpeggiated chord and I think the, the critique of Nashi is probably a bit um, over the top. Thank you very much. <laughs>